research, he focuses on self-organization of cognitive pro pro processes in the brain. <coughs> yeah, we're looking very much forward to it. And um, so please give them a warm welcome. say something useful about, so um, one thing comes another, and well, here I am. Uh, the work I will be talking about is based on the cooperation of many people, two of them I will mention, uh, Gerhard Dahlenor, the theoretical physicist, uh, now no retired, but a lot, a lot, many of his ideas I will be talking about uh, are his, and later we continue with it. And Barry Weyers, um, he is a psychophysiologist working in Groningen, and I will talk also about ERP studies and edit them together with uh, Barry. Since, it's a, since it is already a bit late in the conference, I thought it would be nice to uh, give you uh, something uh, light to start with. And uh, you may think you the monkey business. So what you said really true. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? <laughs> Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. <laughs> and that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. This is the work of uh, Simon Simmons and his um, co workers, and well, he, it's, he, he credits, but it shows um, well, typical aspects of our cognition that were already alluded to in the previous talks. And uh, change blindness, the phenomena that the, that it, uh, that the video was about, will also come back. And, um, well, uh, it is one of the phenomena that uh, uh, the models we have been working on in the forum uh, attempt to uh, explain. Uh, to get the, the bigger uh, picture um, about the bridge between uh, lower and higher cognition, which is the general, general topic of this uh, conference, uh, the gap that is in between them is not uh, in the world itself, it's in the models we make of the world. And um, we have models of the mind and models of the brain. And there is a top-down approach in which uh, formalisms of functions are trying to uh, be implemented in terms of brain mechanisms. And, I, I th sorry. Uh, Actually, you could uh, see that as functionalism in the sense that it is not a eliminative form of functionalism, but you try to get from the higher functions to the neural mechanisms. Alternatively, you can go upward, see what properties these mechanisms produce in their um, interaction, and that's actually the classical question of self-organization. But uh, if you 
consider that as reductionism, you should consider it as a non-eliminative form of reductionism. And then functionalism and reductionism, which by themselves are strange bedfellows, are in fact two sides of the same coin. And I think uh, many of the problems in our understanding the brain uh, are about reconciling these two different types of uh, looking at uh, human behavior, human cognition, animal behavior. And, uh, well, the fascinating question is in studying things from a perspective of self-organization and going in between these levels and finding out what corresponds to what, either in a top-down or in a bottom-up way. You, you, at a certain point, you must find the key to how this uh, self-organization in humans and uh, animals uh, comes about. Uh, we first proceed in a bottom-up fashion, starting at the uh, level of the neural mechanisms with the Habian learning rule. If you accept this learning rule, then you must accept the cluster formation, which is the result of the learning rule. And if you go one step further, another necessary consequence is that these clusters of neurons must have a so-called critical threshold not an absolute threshold, but a critical threshold, which means that when a certain amount of, when a certain number of neurons get uh, excited strongly enough, then the excitation grows autonomously to its maximum level, they self-ignite. This was a property discovered by Breitenberg and somewhat later by Dalmort. And you could think that it is just an accidental property of neurons that is self-strengthening process occurs, but you could also say that it, is, that it plays a rather important role. And that's what we uh, will be, uh, that, that has been our line of research in Cronin. If you um, this depict these um, um, cell assemblies, which in the brain are distributed, but if you depict, depict them as um, uh, circles in this uh, diagram, then uh, this um, autonomous growth of excitation plays a key role in how excitation propagates uh, through a network in the sense that um, a cell assembly, here the cell assembly J1, uh, only uh, becomes so strongly excited that it performs this, uh, that it uh, uh, gets into this uh, autonomous growth of excitation if the two inputs are strong enough. And then, of course, you have mechanisms to, to, for inhibition, which, um, if necessary, um, uh, inhibit the excitation which causes this autonomous growth. So you get uh, what we call propagation of loops through a network. So uh, here you see, see a period of autonomous um, growth of excitation above the dotted line, which is the critical threshold. If a second uh, excitation arrives from, an, from another cell assembly, then this third cell assembly uh, gets in this mode of uh, supra-threshold excitation, and the other two cell assemblies are uh, inhibited, either completely or differently. So you have excitation above and below the critical threshold, which uh, may correspond to certain forms of explicit memory, conscious awareness, if the excitation is above the critical threshold. If it is below the critical threshold, then you may be in a state of priming, or in the example that we saw just before, you may be in a state of change blindness, that you did not explicitly note, notice that uh, something has changed. Um, so these uh, excitation loops, they may converge on, uh, on certain cell assemblies or they may diverge and uh, the parameter space under which this happens is still, uh, well, not very well known and has to be explored, has to be explored more at the neural level. Um, if we then uh, reason in a top-down manner, then um, oh, sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, the um, binding problem was mentioned yesterday. 
one form of binding, a feature binding, you find it in the formation of a cell assembly. In fact, the cell assembly corresponds to a memory trace at the functional level. It is uh, an object in, in our environment, and the memory trace also represents expectations we have about that object whether we should run away from it, whether we should eat it, um, and therefore it uh, uh, unites uh, neurons from very different parts of the brain so that uh, the cell assembly obtains its identity ultimately from its uh, connections with neurons in the sensory and in the motor systems. And um, this is an important point, so we, we will come back to binding. Namely, that there is a different form of binding. If you reason in a top-down manner, you can arbitrarily associate any two items, or I can arbitrarily associate any item in any location. Um, this is uh, referred to as variable binding, and um, we heard a problem yesterday. Uh, in our models, we have a, a different. Uh, uh, proposition, namely a, a, a different solution which relies on the notion of context. If two memory traces are active, or a memory trace of an object and a memory and an excitation pattern corresponding to its location, so in the, in the network there is also a uh, spatial map in which uh, excitations represent locations of objects in the external world. world. If um, uh, these um, excitation patterns belong to the same context, it um, are also receive activation from uh, memory traces who were previously activated. And if they are simultaneously active, then a temporary connection is formed. That means that along an existing neural pathway, uh, two memory traces or a memory memory trace and an excitation in pattern in the spatial map can keep each other active for some time. There is a temporary resonance among them. And um, this, the important point of this is that this binding, this temporary connection, has to function, has to work together with this loop propagation on permanent connections. And Therefore it, is in some way has pro therefore, it has properties which are not shared by the properties of these permanent connections, in the sense that this, you have, in our model we have to assume that this temporary connection works in both directions. Uh, one node can activate the other and vice versa. Um, Then, in these hypotheses, there, um, there is a little problem because um, in our environment there are generally more than one object in one location. In general, there are several objects which are present simultaneously at several locations. And then this solution which we propose here is, would be insufficient. Instead, uh, we then have to uh, add to the solution the so-called scanning mechanism which uh, ensures that if there is a uh, simultaneous input of several objects occurring simultaneously that not all this input uh, enters the network simultaneously but uh, one after the other in a manner that can be influenced by a certain task or some environmental influence. So if, uh, for instance, uh, four letters uh, appear simultaneously, there occurs this um, sequential binding, this serial binding, and um, this serial binding is then less vulnerable to um, interference because the effect of uh, context that I was uh, talking about, the fact that this temporary connection comes, to an, comes into existence, uh, at the neural level, it means that the spikes produced by the neurons in this cell assembly and the neurons in that cell assembly, that the spikes produced in both neurons are in synchrony, and that triggers a um, that triggers that a pathway becomes available by 
by means of which this uh, resonance can temporarily occur um, if it is not uh, confirmed, if it is not uh, consolidated, sorry. Um, what would be the result? What, why do we suppose that it is a serial binding process? Um, it has uh, a theoretical, it opens the theoretical possibility of explaining why representations of sequence come into being. Representations which may originate in the development of infants when they learn to move their eyes in coordination with their hand and that they can fixate, that they can fixate one location after the other, go back and then continue, and that they can, and that they learn to grab at certain places. This may give rise to a um, representation for sequence in general, a so-called global sequence network, and these uh, global sequence networks may then um, migrate, may uh, be become uh, distributed over the network in local sequence networks uh, belonging to specific memory traces, in this case of uh, the representation of uh, positions of letters in words. Um, so these are the basic ingredients of our network and they make up for a universal computational system. Anything that you want to do can be done with the things that I have just uh, discussed. And we um, focused on a number of tasks under which the change blindness task but also word recognition and a variant which is reporting a letter at a given position at a word, uh, something that any adult um, <coughs> reader, experienced reader, can easily do if, if the words are not uh, too long. And uh, this puts additional uh, requirements on the, uh, on the network. Um, so, I can show you briefly some of the simulations. So you see these loop propagations uh, appearing one after the other and leading to a link, uh, steadily increase in the um, uh, excitation of a word. And uh, at the same moment, the, the sequence network reaches its end and um, there is a, a complex structure of loops which uh, maintains a little which persists a little bit longer than the months before marking the end of the word. And the, the, the cell assembly for the word itself um, uh, reaches the critical threshold. And for your consciousness, you perceive the word in one glance, although at a level which is intransparent to our consciousness, the serial process functions very rapidly. Um, so, oh sorry. Um, you can then reuse these uh, same structures in the network to do such a task uh, like what is the third or fourth letter of a word. And so you have then have to uh, have a, a global process in the network which is able to interrupt processes at a lower level having to do with which letter is with at, at what position. And that is basically what, what happens in this um, diagram of the various excitation curves. And, um, well, this is uh, something that I think uh, puts, can put me right on uh, some insights of uh, human uh, uh, reading, single word reading. Change blindness is um, uh, influenced by, can be influenced by the number of identical objects for which you have to identify a change. And a very straightforward prediction of the network is that if you have more identical objects in the display, the change of one of them into another will um, be more easily identified. And the reason for that at the neural level is that if an object occurs several times in the display, it will have several temporary connections to the spatial map and therefore become more easily reactivated if necessary. So as we heard in the last talk, working memory um, 
at least to some extent, is also represented by means of uh, synaptic connections. And this is an entirely in line with the view that binding uh, necessary for retaining uh, locations and other properties of objects uh, is uh, represented by means of these temporary connections which remain even if the activation has um, uh, decayed. Um, well, here are the, the, the lines in the various colors uh, indicate the various predictions. We have done, uh, we are currently doing uh, several studies about mask priming, in which uh, a word appears after a, a mask and is preceded by uh, different types of primes, which can be the begin letters or the end letters. And then after the word or the non-word is presented, people have to decide uh, whether it is indeed a word or a non-word. This is a classical lexical, lexical decision task. But within the literature on um, word reading models, um, um, a serial process in word reading is generally not uh, acknowledged to be uh, a central process, whereas according to this model it would be. And we do find some evidence for a begin prime in this uh, um, experiment and also an earlier onset in the EEG of a component uh, reflecting the effect of the uh, begin prime. If you uh, ask people to report a certain letter at a certain position, then um, uh, you get results which also conform the, um, uh, the expected uh, results from the model in the sense that for words, uh, uh, the uh, performance is more or less equal over positions, whereas for non-words you see a steep decrease over the first uh, positions until the before last, and then an increase, which reflects the um, uh, decay of the strength of the temporal connections due to the um, serial binding process. Um, there is this change blindness uh, experiment which you can do with these different displays of letters. And uh, we see then an increase of the uh, sensitivity of the change detection with uh, an increase in the number of, uh, of letters. So these are some examples of uh, current studies. Um, if I uh, generalize, then it's still a long way to uh, self-organization. The, the, the networks that um, uh, we are studying now are still constructed, they are, but they are constructed by means of principles which are necessary to make them uh, self-organizing, to make them self-organizing, and also taking into account arguments of uh, developmental psychology and. Um, what we know about how cognitive uh, structures can be used and reused. The uh, process of the um, hypotheses about uh, variable binding can um, be generalized in, in other studies uh, about the interaction of syntax and semantics in uh, sentences which were also discussed in, uh, in this conference in which you have an illusion that there is uh, nothing wrong, but there is something wrong with the sentence, or, but you, you are blind to it. Garden path sentences are, are also a very nice topic to investigate. And with respect to, uh, in, in relation to reasoning, um, there are these uh, well-known experiments by Wayson and Johnson Laird, which go already way back, in which people uh, are much worse in reasoning if they, have a, if they have to do a, a formal reasoning, whereas the same reasoning process, when, when applied to material which is familiar to them, I usually explain this by means of envelopes and um, post stamps which you have to put on them, but my students do, do not use any postcards anymore, so I have to, I have to switch to a different example. But these, um, these phenomena can very well be understood in terms of this model, by means of binding, which relies heavily on the context in which the certain process takes place. Well, 
this was this one main things. I didn't say all of it, but uh, I hope you got the main message of the model. And, uh, I thank you for your attention.